Why don't you start giving the signals in Spanish or something? <laughs> now the news. Children, uh, oh, by the way, for those of you who may have started watching this on some regular basis, on those nights that you find my comments to really soar and to take off and to lead your thoughts into brand new areas, I'm on drugs. <laughs> Oh, and, by, and also on those nights when you think it goes nowhere and just nothing happens, I'm on drugs. <laughs> I trust perhaps that clarification will aid you in your viewing enjoyment. <laughs> now, the news. Children initially get lost in a swamp wherein they experience chills, cramps, and other minor ills. And even after they physically age, if they do not so mentally, they become the simple of adulthood. And in being such, continue throughout their lives to suffer the ills of childhood. There was once two genies trapped in a bottle. And one of them said, my feet hurt. And the second one said, that's nothing. My head hurts. And the first one was at first somewhat nonplussed and rendered silent. But finally retorted, yeah, but even stuck here in, your head can still move about a bit by way of your mind while my feet are so confined that they can get no exercise. Then it was the first genie's turn, the second genie's turn to feel momentarily topped, but quickly recovered and replied, well, hell, when it comes to the matter of feet, what are you doing in here in the first place? Feet could have run for it and escaped, but where the hell can a mind go? And after saying that, they both felt additionally confused and confined. Moral, don't say where you hurt unless you know what causes it. And now this brief pause for no other reason than to have a brief pause before the next story. Okay, long enough. A mighty warrior's myth. Just seconds before he died, one guy said, okay, I do hurt a little. And wham, he was out of there. <laughs> and now another story from our mystics book of bedtime tales. This one entitled, Life at the Top of the Heap. I'm sorry, this page seems to be blank. <laughs> one man declared, the weather here is far too erratic for me to live here. His declaration, as far as I can tell, had nothing whatsoever to do with anything that this evening has gone before. The ruler of a certain kingdom had, at one time, decided to appoint one of his courtiers to the combined position of royal priest and high thinker. But after becoming aware of how unpredictable the man was, concluded that it would be an unwise move. That is, if he wanted to hold together his dinky little domain... And several minds upon hearing this story loudly noted that they did not care in the least to be referred to as domains. No. One guy finally told himself this. Look, if you haven't come to the end of your rope yet, you've got a lousy rope. <laughs> Moral, if you can live in waltz time and die in 2-4, then why not the same relationship between what you know and what you don't? And the ruler of a certain kingdom said... If that's a moral, I'll eat a fried rat. <laughs> yeah, he actually said that. I, just, I had to double check. The more men talk about themselves, the more able they feel to separate themselves from aspects of their behavior they find indefensible. A sailing we will go. Hormones float all the ships while neurons appear to steer them. What do you mean, shout all at sea? Appear to. <laughs> Without question, man's most efficient and enduring hobby is his psychological problems. Efficient in that it costs nothing and enduring in that it never gets used up. The problems are never cured. Continuing city updating regarding offensive information. 
the typically insightful therein reveal, I think, therefore I take umbrage. <laughs> the more intensely do men look at local immediate matters, the better able they seem to keep their balance. To be more conscious, of course, is to do otherwise. One man used to get his inspiration from others, then from books, then from animals, then from vegetables, and now he's got it down to mostly himself. <laughs> Such be the progression of hero worship for many a mystic. One of the great things about experiencing the secret is that after that, you don't ever have to join anything ever again. Think of the money you'll save just in Jews. Inside of every kingdom is another kingdom, and inside of every inhabitant there is another inhabitant, and inside of every thought and every inhabitant is yet another thought. The mighty works of man all stand on other works of man. Life through man but unrealized by man always breathing life in and breathing life out, pushing man ever onward, onward to ever evolving new kingdoms just over every horizon and within which exist never-ending new horizons. If travelers on the Mystical Express did have prayers, one of them might be, Dear God, don't let the train run down and out of tracks before I do. <laughs> <clears throat> to be more conscious is to be able to consume the food life has provided without, in the process, eating up and destroying yourself. Each time you take any normal mental conflict to be worthwhile and enter therein, you are blinded thereby. There is no proper defense of any local position. More regarding its uniqueness. Men can be bullied into almost anything except being more conscious. Abe, you're right. You recently mentioned someone's invention of a new word, flagomire, <laughs> for use when there is no word to adequately express that which is desired, which seemed to me at the time a beneficial effort. But after some later reflection, it strikes me that this achievement could be carried even further by now coming up with a synonym for flagomire. <laughs> But truth to tell, I have been most hesitant to write you about this because I feared you'd think I was about to kill the redundant that laid the envelope pusher. <laughs> but yours nonetheless, etc. One man said that until he heard the song, Little Things Mean a Lot, he never realized how much he meant. The simple feel little stress. Well, from the view of the sophisticated, stress too simple to be of any significance. While on the other fashionably gloved hand, the sophisticated feels stress that is more, shall we say, and why not, more becoming, an up-to-date, concerned, and knowledgeable man of the world. Moral, is this a, shall we say, okay, a joke? Calm down, for Christ's sake, it's just a moral. Okay, moral. If the rats and the sewers don't get you, the pigeons with rabies will. <laughs> Legend tells of a certain king who once posed this question to his knights. From whence cometh the stress men feel in being alive? Cometh it directly from his hormones, or be it deriv deriveth indirectly somehow via his neurons? And after a period of thoughtful sounding silence, one warrior raised his hand and said, My liege, why are you speaking in such an archaic manner when it's 1995? <laughs> Moral, some questions can't be answered from where you're standing now. In the prehistory of mythology, the very first heroic figure was the very first man who spoke. One man's current view. It does no good to talk about thinking until you understand its dependence on feeling. And it behooves you not to discuss feelings until you can explain to yourself how. In one quite real sense, feelings would not exist if not beforehand they could be thought of. He says that there is even more to this, but that he can't go into it just now 
that he's again developed this certain dizzying headache and must go lay down for a while. He says that most of you will probably understand. The unrecognized nature of attempts by ordinary men to be of help to one another. Only those with you on a sinking ship will offer their assistance. <laughs> the reason you see so few mystics giving to charity is because they understand that the real needs of man cannot, through the physical, be met. For many years did one faithful passenger on the great mystical express try and change his seat. For one reason just so his mind could have a better view. <laughs> and today was just revealed, even your research, in which it is claimed that a heretofore undetected frequency exists in all of human speech, which causes a wide range of mutations in man's mental processes. <laughs> the far-flung frontiers of most men's minds, they sum up in such words as, and stuff like that. <laughs> More regarding its singularity. Men can fake being almost anything except more conscious. <laughs> Lit at a higher level. If rewrites amount to anything, then the writing itself to begin with had to not. Right? Oh, okay. If rewrites amount to anything, then the writing itself to begin with had to not. <laughs> the reason that cannibals always look so obvious, right? They only eat themselves. One of the enlightened, looking back at his old original mind, said to it, I've thrown up more than you ever even chewed on. <laughs> And the teacher asked the class, would you like to go back and would you like to go back over and review what we learned today? And they immediately set fire to her to protect themselves from the evil spirits of repetition. <laughs> no run of the mill matriculants here, what? Some sophisticated health news that none who are so can use. Some sophisticated health news that none who are so can use. <laughs> you begin to make me think that repetition does have some value. <laughs> the more serious you are, the greater your likelihood of illness. And it does no good to stick out your tongue at the king if you don't actually know who's running things. The song of would-be city comedians... I shot some humor into the air, and it never fell back to earth. <laughs> in the main ballroom during the afternoon session, in the grips of what at first appeared to be patriotic fever, a man leaped to his feet and began to sing, Yank my doodle, it's a dandy. <laughs> and a chap in back, Looked confused and asked the man next to him, is this an eroticism convention or the one on the production of new ideas? I'm not going to read that one over. <laughs> Noting the many pair of eyeglasses strewn about the parade ground, the drill sergeant barked, break time, maybe even think time. Then looking down directly at the sight enhancers added, wear them if you got them which none of those, not above the rank of plagiarists, had the least idea what meant. Do you? With the ordinary, talk is the ultimate justification, explanation, and defense of oneself. A little known, hell, little known, but nevertheless, a little-known version of the creation myth says that God initially created a gigantic lake, now known as the universe, into which he eventually threw a rock, producing ripples, and the ripples became man. P.S. Now that I've made it publicly known, you think it'll catch on? Mm -hmm. 
The reason there is never a, satis a fully satisfying conclusion to any of men's mental disputes is because there is not supposed to be. An interesting and curious sub-aspect of this is that, although the situation is normally unrecognized by men, if it is directly pointed out to them, they will inevitably come to a momentary stop as they consider this most unexpected idea, and then will freely say that it is patently not correct. <laughs> While dreams can get the ordinary excited, they tend to make mystics hungry and just a bit aggravated. <laughs> One day, as he observed the boisterous behavior of some children and the disapproving glances of some nearby sedate adults, a man reflected on a similar situation in his own mind between new unruly ideas and the already established and comfortable ones. And now for that feature of the show we call FFF time. Time for some friggin' facts, folks. Fact. If there was no bad news out in the world, men would have to invent some. Fact, fact. Where do you think it comes from anyway? With ordinary men, talk is their anchor. With the few, they're dead weight. Another reason that the secret must be generally withheld from men. If people realize just how automatic is thought, they wouldn't take it serious enough. More regarding its one of a kindness. Men can be made interested in almost anything. That's right, except then you know what. Another version of one of the myths regarding man's early and disastrous days says that the first mortals were not driven from paradise because one of them ate of a forbidden food and enticed the other one to do so also. But rather than a fruit being involved, it was a mental audio amplification device that Eve discovered and tried on. And for the first time, one human could hear what another one was thinking. A situation that initially the gods found threatening to their position. In re normal mental nourishment. When life invites man to dinner, it is he who is always the meal. Which is why you see so few mystics dining out. The mind is like a two-handed juggler. It can handle three objects at a time, but one of them always being up in the air, it senses the presence of only two. At city level... Sanity consists of a closed-in area. At the transcendental, sanity is no more than the wearing of proper attire to city functions. <laughs> Men love to dream of extraterrestrial beings because of the extraordinary view of us that have. That seems impossible for us down here. Another reason you find so few of the enlightened with local addresses. It's not only a matter of the more conscious not wanting to live in a place where they'd be welcome. They don't want to even live in a place where it's possible for them to live. The mind of the awakened is like a five-handed juggler. At least. A consummate view of the noise men make. Talk has power and significance only as men believe that it does. A mything we will go. <laughs> Men have myths for all occasions. And on those occasions when they don't, they have occasions for all their myths. It all works out. <laughs> and finally, a father noted to his son. Not for naught is the mind's operations referred to as man's critical faculties. And the lad responded, you mean because it's always finding fault? kind of critical faculties and the old man slapped his thigh and then the kid's head with glee chortling the higher you climb up my tree the more and more fun you are to talk to and with parallel merriment the boy hit himself upside the head <laughs> now from our holiday calendar this reminder inside the more focused it's always father and sunday
Is this legible on camera? Yes. Damn, is it legible in person? <laughs> Can you read it on camera, you think? Yes. Even what if you can't, so what? <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Let's be fair about it. My implication, it doesn't matter. All of you watching this, that can, that it is legible to you, write in and tell me what you think it means. And those of you that can't make any sense of it, do the same. <laughs> or better yet, just swap letters. <laughs> I was going to direct your attention again to the matter of uh, involving the local and the universal. And after all this time, perhaps I should offer some definition of what I mean. The terms are common enough, and they are in fact used in a pseudo-uncommon manner, sometimes I know at least universal, by the pseudo-mystical. When I say local, most of the time, I'm referring to the mind using specific examples, which it has to do. The mind must use specific examples in the same way that the mind must use symbols, words, in our case of humans on planet Earth, for the mind to operate. It cannot begin to function without it being able to deal in specifics, in examples. They're neither good nor bad. It's not a problem, it is a primary requirement for the basic operation of the human intellect. But anytime you're dealing with examples, you're dealing with, in a wider sense, what I generally refer to as local phenomenon. Now, a bit more specific. Last time we were talking, and there were several stories tonight that touched upon the same thing, said any time that, well, there's several ways. First off, all debate, all mental conflict has to do with local affairs, local matters. There's no such thing as an exception to that, whether it be apparent theoretical conflict regarding Political ideas, economic ideas, religious ideas, cultural ideas, it matters not what, as long as it's not physical. As long as we're not talking about actual territorial disputes, which is, in a pristine manner, is almost a, an impossibility for humans today. But other than that, other than two guys fighting over a territorial dispute at their place at the bar, or fighting over the waitress, when it comes to the matters, only those matters deemed worthwhile, too sophisticated, educated, civilized men and women, <clears throat> it is always mental conflicts, it is always philosophical disputes. But they are always, please note, they are always about local matters. They are always based upon example. Uh, the statement itself, unless you have the ability to stretch your frontier, the frontiers of your mind past the point that one man, or that I point out tonight, that most people the avant-garde, the far-flung, the advancing frontiers of most men's intellect can be summed up in words such as, and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> so some of you, the whole thing may have sounded as though it was some sort of throwaway, obscure joke, but the truth is that is extremely enlightening if you don't have squinty little eyes. <laughs> <laughs> There's been other manifestations in other periods of history in other areas of the world, but right now, in the English speaking part of the world, 
Uh, that is a fair representation of the exemplification of ordinary man's minds. is to make up whatever great statement or retort or observation they have to make and to show you the progressive, far-reaching, far-thinking aspects and depths of their intellect. After they get through, they will oftentimes conclude the sentence with <laughs> and stuff like that. <laughs> Try and combat that. I know that and someone just said they couldn't believe how far I can get off of any one subject and they're wrong. <laughs> I'm sure that there are people right now, ordinary social critics, who would say, well that's no more than people going, you know, you know, it's no more than a kind of mechanical pause. It is no more than what would normally be a pause in a conversation, but rather than be that kind of silence, you go, well, you know, you know, it's just mechanical talk. Yes, you could say that. But I attempt, as opposed to all of these routine social critics with good haircuts and suits and ties, I try to give men more credit. You could certainly say that people will say something about, well, I think so and so, and I believe that men do such and such for this and that reason, you know, and stuff like that. <laughs> you, you could say that that's just mechanical talk and they're not even listening. Now, I'm not saying that's not true. But let us give men more credit, at least more hand gestures. And say, and I'm, I'm pointing out to you that that, in fact, even though the speaker may not be cognizant of it at the time, it is a, it is a subtle attempt for him to imply that his mind has further <laughs> frontiers, further possibilities than may be directly exemplified in his just announced verbiage. That's why I was saying try and refute it because you go, well, I can tell you this, I can tell you exactly why the conservatives won such an astounding victory, such a surprising victory over the Labor Party last year. And they go, and it was because obviously of the Prime Minister's inverted idea of what amounts to social and economic reform and you know and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, if you can understand it, it's like a, it's like a more enlightened ellipses. <laughs> it's inferring that, well, I made some observation that you may or may not be able to ridicule or confront. But it's not only that, it's another, you know, stuff like that. And you're kind of left. Maybe you were right, sir. Maybe I did go too far afield. <laughs> I say that to try and calm the palpitations of anyone's head who thinks, well, even I didn't understand that, and I've heard this several times. <laughs> all mental conflict, all debate, all discussion, all argument between peoples, between groups of people, but between men, is always based upon local matters. It has to have an example. How I got into this, believe it or not, what I just got out of, was that the mind cannot easily even comprehend what I just said, assuming that if I repeated it and wrote it down, that you might be able to rhetorically say that, well, yeah, the sentence does make sense. But God damn, what does it mean? The problem is, the mind trying to make meaning has just been gobbled up by what I said, because... All, all speech is based upon local matters. It is based upon example. And the reason I just did that is I'm trying to give you at least, we'll start off with symbolism and hope for the best. Hope perhaps that I can bring out an allegorical Richard Petty, get him back behind the wheel and drive that son of a bitch in to the fast track of metaphor <laughs> from symbolism from whence we might be able to put wings on that sucker and then fly off into the super literal again. <laughs> All debate and argument starts out, or it's based on local affairs. And what I was going to use, this is not a perfect example, but to try and give your mind some attempt to squeeze into a crack. Let's say that men are discussing uh, politics, such as I just did. Or they're trying to describe why one political party in some place is gaining 
uh, precedence over another. And they argue back and forth. So they may argue over uh, various uh, conflicting political models of you know, republicanism versus uh, fascism, or socialism versus communism. You understand that's only an example, and they will never even get around at the ordinary level. I repeat, this is not the punchline to it, because there is no verbal punchline to this. But you understand that ordinary, serious people, and many people, I'm not making fun yet of that, that they take political matters serious. It could be religious or anything else. That here it is, they have a framework. One of them starts a discussion. It may be his field of expertise. He may be defending one form of government or the theory of it, and another man waits his turn, and then he responds. And they debate the matter. And let us say that they are recognized experts in this area. Their discussion will never get around to a wide philosophical idea of government in general. Oh, I know that somewhere, given enough time, one of them will say, they'll throw in the conversation. One of them will say something like, well, the matter I'm trying to bring out refers not just to the specific examples upon which you and I have our present disagreement, but it, it touches more on the wider picture of what is, the, philo the wider philosophical question, just what is government? Which is always a nice pause. That's even better in some cases than, and stuff like that. Because it sounded as though the man has just expanded, or just revealed and expanded, uh, potency of his own intellectual wherewithal. But it means nothing. He just says it. They don't go into it. Do you understand? And if he says it, another guy, his opponent, goes, hmm. That normally is other man if they're both ordinarily sophisticated and experts, knowledgeable in the field. The other man will have to go. Hmm. Because he's not agreeing. The man did not make, in that case, a biased point from his view. He just says, well, this whole matter that we're now discussing actually touches upon, has wider ramifications than the mere examples uh, over which we are now wrangling, it actually touches, if I may say so, into the matter of what is the true nature, what should be the true nature of government. And he looked at his opponent, hmm? And it's such a statement, the other guy goes, oh, yes. And it sounds as though they have both perhaps raised the intellectual stakes a bit higher. But they have not. It will not go anywhere. No one debates. No one finds conflict I repeat, that was not a perfect example. But once you get past specific locals, matters, and you try to expand it, the ordinary mind, even of experts, just the mind of ordinary men, begins very quickly. That as you attempt to expand the area that might be considered, there is a parallel ratio having to do with the rapidity, the speed with which ordinary minds lose interest therein. It's just a fact. It has nothing to do with education. It's got nothing to do with IQ, as you call it, or as you know it. It is just a fact. In fact, the more expert a man is, the less likely he is, the less able he is, the less interested he is, take your choice, of uh, sustaining his part in any wide-reaching philosophical discussion of his area of expertise. The more expert you are, the more you're expert in some specific area within a specific field. That's how you become more and more expert. Why do you go back to school? To use that as a symbolism to start with, as symbolic for what I'm referring to. Why do you go back to school and get graduate degrees? You've already got your bachelor's degree in science. And then you go back and you get your master's in physics. And then you go back and do your doctoral, get your doctorate degree in subatomic physics. You keep narrowing down the local matters. You make the examples more and more confined and refined. And the more that a man, he is now a recognized expert in, of course nowadays just go three areas and not much, but let's say subatomic physics. But by now, if he's already had that degree for a while and continues to push forward in the city level world of academia, then after a few years, he is down to some, he's probably tried to make up or claim to have discovered his own private area. That if his name is Dr. Wackensack, it's now, he's come up with some theory, the, the Wackensackian theory, Wackensackian theory of bilateral, subterranean 
<laughs> subatomic physics. There. So he's down to that level. Now, the more he is an expert there, the less interest he has, the less inclined he is to, the less able you are to get him involved with a wide discussion of physics. Just that, his original field. He could have some explanation, and if you tried to, and he declined, and you said, well, I just noticed you won't even discuss physics in general. He would treat it on the basis of, well, look, that's, that's something for high school teachers. That'd be something for some, just someone with a general passing interest in physics. I mean, I'm sorry, but on that point, it's boring. That's not it. That would be their explanation, and amongst other boring, I mean, other ordinary people, <laughs> that is fresh currency right off the presses. They will accept it. You hand it to another man, and he has to take it, or else he's not playing fair. <laughs> and, and, and that's kind of heartbreaking. Nobody wants to see, like a couple of Nobel Prize winners up there, and one of them hand a man, like, well, this is beginning to reach into the basic philosophical question of just what is science? Hmm? And the other guy goes, no, it doesn't. <laughs> that's like one guy, one of the Nobel Prize winners, trying to hand a man something, and the other guy goes... <laughs> Very unseemly. That, just life does not allow that generally to happen. They all play along. And so a man will say, well, I just have no, my interest is more specific than the general area of physics. And that seems to fly. It makes sense at that level. But I am telling you that is not the basic operational construct of it. That is not the dynamic that runs it. It is that the ordinary mind has no real interest, nor is it able to easily. Huh easily <laughs> perceive to think of life in terms of universals. And by universals, I don't even mean the secret of life or being able to in some way look out and gulp the truth of existence, the secret of life all in one big gulp. The mind, just think about it. You've got your own mind. It doesn't have to be in any particular field. I've made up now several examples. But the mind just generally does not think in any way that pushes against its ordinary boundaries. A man observing the boisterous behavior of some children and the disapproving glances, the kind of irritation of some sedate adults nearby. And he pondered and reflected on the similar conditions within his own mind. And one way that the mind stays calm and comfortable is it deals in examples. I mean, that is the basis of it. And as I point out to you, without it, the mind can never start. And most people care to go no further. Even if they wanted to, they're not sure what to do. They might even try to tune in somebody like me and go, well, hey, he's going to tell me how. And then they listen a while and go, he ain't telling me how. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> you think that's why I've yet to win a Nobel Prize? <laughs> I get stuck and go, aha, but I'm the one who stuck myself. <laughs> Well, in that case, does this make sense? <laughs> when my back was turned, I stuck my tongue out. It is not only debate and conflict between men, between individual men, you understand. Your mind operates on the same basis. You are in a continual state. If you're just up to ordinary city speed of in the intellect, you're in a continual state, albeit not known as such, but of conflict, of debate with yourself, if you are striving even at the minimal level, at the ordinary level, to stay intellectually alive. It doesn't amount to anything. It amounts to this, an ordinary man. Uh, he picks up, turns on the news, and uh, there is a someone running for... Uh, Parliament on the labor ticket. And they get up and go, blah, 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 blah. And he begins to intellectually, he begins to mentally respond to them on the basis that he and his father and his grandfather have all been a socialist or Christian Democrats. And he responds to it, and in a sense, it's a debate to him. But he is, what he is doing is correcting this man. What he is doing is defending to himself the proper intellectual position. It a little bit, again, it's of no useful pertinence, but just to make the point, some men try a little bit, even at the ordinary level, to go beyond that, that they try and keep the intellect stirring, showing some signs of life, by, throughout their life, trying to consider new ideas, 
and I say consider, that they will read speeches by members of an opposing political party. They will attempt to read uh, books in areas in which they seem to have no natural interest. They will attempt, as they would call it, to stretch their mind, to try and not let the old neuron just wither away. <laughs> but it is all still done, even when they attempt that, it is all still done on the basis of them being intellectually involved. Again, I repeat, with ordinary people, they have no choice. It's not a matter of stupidity. They are dealing with examples. They are dealing with local matters. That is why, every time I bring this up or slip it into a story, someone will always go, ah, like they saw something. It's why I point out that, for instance, men do not study. You know, when they're studying psychology, they're not studying men. Or when they're studying psychiatry, they're not studying men. They're studying psychiatry. Or when men study theology, they're not studying the spiritual aspect of man in any way, whatever they want to call it. They're studying theology. All of these fields of study, even that one? Yes, that one. <laughs> I don't know why you people get so upset about hand gestures. You know, the, the Pope does it. <laughs> or whatever it is he does. I, I always get that confused. <laughs> Maybe that's why I'm not invited to any more rock concerts than I am when everybody gets carried away and they start all that stuff about, you know, I keep going and they go, or which is it? Well, <laughs> The way that a man ordinarily thinks, even when he believes, even when he is striving to keep himself intellectually alive. He is still being on the basis of examples because the mind is not naturally constructed in such a way that people start off at anywhere and go, what's the nature of life? Now, you might say, no, no, that's not true because would-be mystics, especially in many people that never end up involved with such as this, at some time, at some early age, but especially those wired up to be interested in such affairs later on, at some age, some early age do ask, more or less, what's the nature of life? And what happens to you? You're immediately beset by those with whom or from whom you seek counsel after they once try and wash their hands of you and they once try and figure some way to try to think of a new Flagemeyer term for I don't know. <laughs> what do they do? They will inflict upon thou injurious I was being silly. They will inflict upon you examples. You go to a priest, a rabbi, your uncle, a politician, the mayor, and you go, what's the meaning of life? And assuming they got their wits all about them, they go, ha, very, very good question, my boy. Come over here, let me show you this book. A very good question. You should obviously be studying philosophy, religion, carpentry, Bricklaying. Of course, I'm being silly, you think. But if they immediately, they would generally say, you should be studying. What you should do is go into the area, you should study psychology. Or perhaps you should consider going into the ministry. You should perhaps consider such and such. And sure enough, unless you're exceptionally lucky, well, anyway, you're probably going to fall into some of that for a while. At least you'll pursue it. Because you go, what psychology? They go, ah, let me tell you. It's a whole field of interest. It's a whole field of study. It is down, down near to a science. It's a whole field of study that does, that does nothing but ask, what is the nature of man? Or they might point to you in years past, earlier times, when they could do it with a straight face. You should be studying philosophy. Now the people's mouth normally goes, for, 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 psychology. <laughs> of course, before that it was theology, and then most people now can't, they can't even start. Theology, the word will hit their mind if they're ordinary educated people, and then the lips, you know, <laughs> lips don't even tremble. And they go, theology, and then, go, and then they'll try maybe, for, 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 and they can't get philosophy out of him, or so they go, psycho psychology. And so if someone gives you just a minimal description of psychology, it is very likely, or philosophy as I said, either one, and you go, that's it. Ah, thank God. Let me write philosophy, philosophy. Yes, that is the one area in which men have turned 
the best of men have turned their minds to the question of what is life? Why are we here? What's the purpose of this? And you go, damn, I knew I wasn't alone. You write it down, philosophy. And very likely you can get hung up in it for years or it might bleed you over into metaphysics or it might lead you into psychology. But you end up, no offense to any of the fields. None's no worse than the other. None's any better than the other. You end up studying the field. Not the question, because the question, there's only one question worthy of a real man, worthy of a man's real mind. And that is, huh? That's the only question. <laughs> you know what I mean. I was trying to narrow it down. You people should be... Well, I, was trying to treat, well, I was trying to treat you now on a higher level, closer to being in a... But with ordinary people, you'd say, there's only one question worthy of a real man, and that is, what is the meaning of life? But, you know, damn, that's five or six words. That, that's not like for children. Everybody knows that. So I was just trying to give you credit of having a bit more insight and at least approaching the level of expert. But... but you know there's only one question worthy of a real man. That is, huh? Why? Why? And if you get good, which now I've already done it, but I'll do it on you some other time, it should be down to the point of nonverbal, that the only question worthy of a real man is. Because that's it. All right. But you get into a, a field. You get into a field, which is one position in local matters. You get into a field and you're no longer pursuing the question. You're not studying the question. You're studying the field. There is a point to that of, of me not picking on any particular academic discipline. That's not the point. But the reason I keep putting out using philosophy, uh, psychology, it would seem to me that that is the best. That these easily grasp. That the stated purpose of psychology is the understanding of human nature. I guess is a fair description of it. But you study psychology, and that's not what you study. You study psychology. There's no reason that there seems to be a modicum of humor to point out, as I've done before, that you go in to study psychology, and you get all wound up, and you hear about it, and you enroll in it. And Psychology 101 is usually pretty interesting. It's just a survey, and it's just little funny anecdotes and observations about the nature of man that you never heard about. But then you start getting into at least 102. And what do you end up? Or at least into your second year. And the professor says, well, now you know, we're, bypass, we're past the point of just survey courses and any required uh, humanities that any of you may have had to take earlier, had to have take, taken earlier. We're now into an area to where I assume that most of you have a promising real interest in the area of psychology. So now we can get down to real basics. Now we can start getting somewhere. And you think, ha, ha. And they say, so this first quarter we'll be studying statistics. Second quarter we'll be studying the behavior of white mice. But by the third year we'll be, dis we'll be studying statistics concerning the behavior of white mice. And you think, ah, until you think about it. Of course, most people will never think about it. You end up not studying the point. And there's only, as I said, only one point. That is worthy of a real man's mind, or at least worthy if you don't. Sounds a bit abrasive, but the only one of any interest to anyone with any potential ability to think outside the normal realm. And that is, you know, what, what the hell is going on here? Do you understand it cannot be answered? There's no hope. It's not even the same ball game to go, what is going on here? Because when you say here and do this, you understand I mean this, not here. What you mean is what's going on in this thing. In reality, in life. And you go, well, that's interesting. Okay, where will we start? Well, see, you're done for already. But if you're ordinary, you've got to start somewhere. But when you start somewhere, you have now taken what was the universal. You didn't miss up. Everyone starts off this way. You have taken the universal. And by that, I infer no New age, flim flam, occult, hocus pocus. I mean everything. How about the universe? Everything that the mind normally conceives of to be extant. The question is what's going on. What you're saying is you're asking for what's going on in the universe. The reality as you perceive it. But let's make it simple and direct. The universe itself is, is known. I'll just take whatever the common conception the current one is. 
The only question worthy of a man, his only interest worthy of a real man's mind, should be, you know, what is this? What am I doing here? What the hell is this thing? What's going on? To even start to entertain the question, you have to narrow it down, to say the least. You cannot start out and drink the Pacific Ocean in a gulp. You have to start, so it seems, with a teaspoon. You go, well, I'll take a sip, and I'll get going. You have to. But then you find people, as best they can, still at the age of 85, about to drop over, and they're still on their hands and knees, and now their mouth is withered up from the continual sipping of salt water. <laughs> and you look at them, you look out the ocean, and you think, well, is there any difference? And I've got to tell you, folks, not, 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 try, not trying to be discouraging about it, but uh, I think you know the answer. <laughs> so it cannot be done piecemeal, but here is what it, but it's worse than that. It's more captious than that for the few who have some promise. It's not that it can't be done, uh, but now it, that should be a, that should be obvious, that it is not done piecemeal. You can't tell someone that, nor should you try to, but they wouldn't hear it anyway. It doesn't make any sense if you try to tell someone in the beginning that the secret cannot be discovered in pieces. You can discover pieces of the secret, but the secret itself is not found in the piecemeal workings of the human mind, which has to take the universal and cut it up into local examples. You can learn from it. You can see pieces of it. But pieces of it do not fit together. It's not a process. It's not some logical sequential process of putting together the pieces that you have realized. The extraordinary pieces that you may have personally discovered, it is not a process of putting it together. Which is why, to use other people's terminology from the Buddhist view, enlightenment is not predictable. It is not guaranteed. Uh, there is no sequential discipline that will assure its arrival, that if Buddha ever told, well, I'm sure he did, when he told somebody the best, when he gave several of the methods and whatever he said publicly, and somebody that showed some promise to him aside and say, well, if I do all that, I always ponder how much to say, but what the hell, I always give in anyway. Well, my, my fake it. That someone took him aside and said, well, look, I've listened to everything you had to say, and then they say, oh, pardon me just a second, parenthetically, can I ask this, the kind of things you've been saying, you know, the methods and ideas you've given to follow, is that how you did it? Buddha say, Buddha say, no, but go ahead, kid, hurry up, don't, don't, don't think about it, which of course you shouldn't. But he said, okay, Did everybody follow that? See, this guy takes Buddha aside after, and says, uh, I've listened to everything you said, and uh, can I ask you something personally? And Buddha looks at the kid, and to his magical ability, realizes he's got some promise. And he says, okay, shoot. And the guy says, all these methods and the things you said that we should try? And Buddha says, yeah. And he says, oh, by the way, parenthetically, is that the way you did it? And Buddha go, parenthetically, no, but go ahead. <laughs> so the kid closes the parentheses and says, uh, by the way, if I do all this, you know, then will I be enlightened? And Buddha says, kid, you know, there ain't a guarantee in the world. Glad to see you. Be sure and write. <laughs> and keep in touch. And that's the truth. It cannot be done. But even after that becomes or should become obvious, you cannot put it together. When it happens, then you understand all this. But it cannot be put together. But between here and there, of, of more immediate concern what I was trying to get you to consider is within yourself, not arguing with other people. Because if you're not past that point, uh, theoretically speaking, then you, know, you hadn't run out of rope. <laughs> At any rate, it's not just the point of you being in debate and arguing with other people because I'll assume you're past that point. <laughs> it is internally of you debating ideas with yourself because whenever you're dealing with examples, that is, you're dealing with something less than that which offers some promise of revealing the secret, that is, less than universals, which you can't start doing. I know all that. I'm not said it. But not with saying that fact. Whenever you take in your own mind, that you are defending some position, attacking some other position, let it be known. I'm letting it be known to you. You're dealing with local examples, and they must always be defended, and they lead nowhere. That is the nature of examples. That is the nature of dealing mentally with local affairs. 
they must be defended, and there is no such thing as a local position on the mental battlefield worthy of defense. Not only that, defending it blinds you. Defending it makes you stay where you are. Especially if you think, well, hey, the more I defend this position, I'm getting better at it. Mm -hmm. Or God forbid you win somebody else over to your position. <laughs> and they go, I never realized that you're right. And you think, ho, ho. And Buddha told me that I'd never get anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that your feet are getting stuck to the particular place on the battlefield where you are. Uh, it's more like you are unwittingly pouring cement on your own feet. <laughs> yeah. But don't my opinions fit nice? <laughs> I've noticed more and more people are listening to me. And Buddha thinks, God help you, kid. <laughs> but one more time, forget between you and somebody else. It's you. Anytime that you think that you're making some sort of mental progress, that you're fitting things together, do you understand what you... It's like you believe that you're climbing up another rung of a ladder. But you're the friggin' ladder. Do uh, you want more allegories? And it's in quicksand. It's a ladder to nowhere. It has this magical three stooges kind of ability that you feel like, well, I've made a climb upwards. And every time you do, relative to where you start out, relative to the level of consciousness in the human nervous system, if you do, let's assume that it to you, I have made a, I've moved up another wrong, the ladder, unbeknownst to you, slips down a wrong below the level of consciousness in your same body. And I'm being magnanimous in that picture. There is no such thing as a worthwhile, defendable local position. Any matter that's open to debate, even to you, you go, and that's something to think about. No, it's not. God, run for it. And especially if you think, wait a minute, that, wait a minute. This is pregnant with possibilities. No, it's pregnant with worms. It's, it's, it's pregnant with fried rats on sticks that somebody's going to gag you with. Put it to you another way. I'll refer you back to this. In our closing moments. Have the organist start playing. And <laughs> now I might have her play the organ. Not with, <laughs> not with herself. 